Our next presenter, our keynote, is going to share with us her thoughts about how hospitals can learn from failure, Dr. Anita Tucker. In full disclosure, my first exposure to Dr. Tucker's uh, work and um, I really enjoyed her uh, speaking style was when I was with the Armstrong Institute at Johns Hopkins and she was the uh, Grand Rounds presenter for the Quality Safety Group uh, by an invitation, I believe, from Peter Pronovos. And so um, from that point on, I started to follow her work. She has she is currently the associate professor at the Equestrian School of Business at the Boston University. She's been on the faculty of Wharton School of Business to Harvard, School, Harvard University and Brandeis. She's actually, she received her doctorate in business administration uh, from the Harvard School of Business and she studied under Amy Edmondson. For those of you who follow um, operations research and teamwork, Amy Edmondson is a very large figure in this area and Anita is one of her um, uh, uh, esteemed gra uh, 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 protégés, we'll, we'll say that. Um, the paper that actually caught my attention was a paper that um, Anita wrote called Why Hospitals Fail to Learn from Failure, which actually won an award uh, in managerial uh, science. And she, a lot of her work has gone on to win uh, numerous awards. She has won the dissertation award from Academy Health, the Sloan Industry Studies Fellowship and Best Paper Award from the California Management Review, and has senior editor responsibilities in numerous journals, including the Journal of Operations Management. I'd like to welcome her to Christiana Care. We had a wonderful uh, dinner last night, um, got a chance to talk about all kinds of things. In addition, she brought two of her PhD candidates uh, here uh, from Boston University because we have another session this afternoon with the VI scholars and we'll be talking about collaborative activities. So without further ado, Dr. Anita Tucker. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. I must say it's really humbling to be here after hearing those presentations. And I give talks at lots of institutions, and I have to say I'm really struck by how patient-centered um, the research efforts that are going on here. It was, it was really quite inspiring, so thank you for sharing those um, with me. So what I'm going to talk about today is how hospitals can learn from failure. Let's see if I can get this clicker. Oops. So I'm going the wrong direction. Um, so as you know, there's lots of national efforts to try to improve quality of care. And a lot of them center on how can we find the best practice? So is there a better way of treating patients? And then once we find those better practices, making sure they get implemented on patients. Um, the flip side of the coin is once we learn that something is not effective, um, can we actually stop using that practice? Right? So most of the efforts have been on that. The implicit assumption is that clinicians have the equipment, the medication, the supplies, people information in the right location at the right time in the right form to actually deliver those better practices. Right? So the assumption is that you just need to know in your head what to do, and then the system is going to enable you to do it. Um, and research that I have done, and lots of other people as well, has shown that the reality that this is actually not true. So um, I did time and motion ethnographic type studies of 26 hospital nurses. I shadowed them for their entire shift. So from the moment they started until they went home, which incidentally was not the end of their shift, right? They stayed over 45 minutes unpaid uh, to finish the work they wanted to do for their patients. And about once an hour, the nurse would not have what he or she needed to provide care, right? So this is actually quite a lot of time um, this happened. And I call these operational failures. Um, other people have studied this. Uh, Aisha Gersis, who's at Johns Hopkins, has um, done a lot of work on this as well. And 94% of the time, what the nurses would do, and this is typical of any people, I just happen to study nurses, is a workaround, right? And what the workaround is, is it gets the task done but it doesn't prevent 
that same problem from occurring again in the future. Right? So these were the types of behaviors. I call this first order problem solving. So I really need to do something. Let me scrounge, pilfer, borrow, beg, whatever, to get what it is I need. And then once I get that, I deliver the care and I move on with the rest of my day. So this is the reality um, that I saw. So I would like to say that this is an opportunity for organizational learning because we can use those instances to figure out what's not working well with the system and then try to actually change the underlying system to prevent recurrence. And this would be second order problem solving. So this is just my introduction. I'm going to go into all of these um, things in more detail with more studies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about four different papers. So the first paper is how frequent do these operational failures happen and what are the responses? This was the paper um, that was published in California Management Review. The second paper is what are work design factors? So how can we design people's work? to have more of a learning response, so that when they encounter problems, rather than just doing workarounds, they're more likely to actually try to fix the system. The third factor is, what are the organizational factors that facilitate second order problem solving? So in other words, what can we as managers do to create an organizational culture that people feel safe to speak up about these types of issues? And then the last paper is, how can we design the systems in the first place to prevent operational failures from happening? Right? So can we do preventive design? So this is what I'd like to talk about in the next um, 30 minutes or so that I have with you. So the first study, the frequency of operational failures. So what I was really interested in was frontline problem solving. Right? And this came from my background as an industrial engineer in, believe it or not, ready to spread frosting factories, right? <laughs> Making this very vital product for American society, which is frosting that you put on birthday cakes. <laughs> and it turns out that I would come in in the morning as my quality improvement engineer and find that hundreds of pounds of frosting had been put on hold because some problem had happened in the middle of the night and no, they didn't, they didn't call about it, right? They didn't wake me up in the middle of the night, let me know something was going on. They tried to handle it the best that they could. Um, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And so what I really wanted to do was to be a fly on the wall. Because I was curious, how many times did stuff go wrong that they didn't tell me about, that they fixed, that we never knew disaster was averted? Right? And so I really wanted to know, gosh, in, in the day-to-day -day life of people actually doing the work of organizations, how do they problem solve? What kind of problems do they encounter and what do they do about it? So this is when my very smart advisor, Kent Bowen, said, if you want to study problem solving, study hospital nurses. Right? Because they are at the center of this very complex system, and they're at the bedside, and every minute of the day, they are making these systems work. They're pulling it together at the bedside in real time. So go study nurses if you want to study problem solving. So that's what I did, best advice I ever got. Going the wrong way again. Um, and what I saw was a lot of operational failures. So this is how I define them. It's a disruption in the supply of information, equipment, materials, even people. I saw one maternity ward nurse who wasn't ever able to provide any care for her patient the whole shift because the patient never made herself available, right, the whole shift. So you need the people to be available. That interrupts the successful completion of work. Of these operational failures that I saw, 94% of the time the nurse did a workaround. So this was a patch. Um, and I'll, I have an example I'll share with you that will show some of these. But the big distinction was that there was no effort to prevent similar problems from occurring in the future. And this is similar to Arduris and, Schron, Arduris and Schon's concept of single loop learning. OK, so here's an example. So one of the nurses that I spent a shift with, she was an intensive care unit nurse. And her patient had been in the ICU for over 20 days on a ventilator. Um, he was having trouble breathing. And so he had reached the point where if they couldn't get him off the ventilator, they were going to need to give him a trach. And he really did not want to have this. He was very nervous. And so 
My nurse told me at the start of the shift that her whole objective for the patient was to get him to be as calm and relaxed as possible so he would do well on his weaning experiment. So she really wanted to give him a bath to lower his vital signs and get him calmed down. So the first thing she had to do though was to take a sputum sample. Sputum is a sample from the lungs to see if he has any kind of hospital acquired infection. And she went to do this and found out that there was no more containers on the shelf they were supposed to be. So it took her a little bit to call down and get some more containers sent up. Then she tried to give him a bath, but there were no towels in the unit. This was a Monday of a three-day weekend. She said, oh, we always run out of towels on the Monday of a three-day weekend, but no problem. I know where they are in the, in the other unit down the hall. So I went with her down the hall, and we took some of their towels. <laughs> By the time she came back, the patient um, was not doing well on the, on the weaning experiment. So she had to abort giving him a bath at all. So that was a missed opportunity. Um, and she began preparing for a triple lumen insertion. But she didn't know what supplies. So this is missing information. Is this surgeon, does he want a full drape or a half drape? So being very clever, she said, I'm going to take both. I'm going to take both a full drape and a half drape. And that way, no matter what he wants, I'm going to be prepared. So uh, she did that. At the end of the procedure, we put, I shudder to say this, back on the common cart in the hallway, the supply she hadn't used from that patient. Um, and then the lab called at 2.10 in the afternoon to say that they had lost the sputum sample. Somehow it never made it down, and she had to take another one. So these are examples of operational failures. And individually, honestly, they seem quite little, right? Only took her a couple minutes to go down the hall and get some towels. Only took five minutes or whatever to get the lab to send up more containers. She just had to do another sputum sample. But what I can tell you, because I spent weeks in this ICU, was that patient was diagnosed with having MRSA. And those supplies that we put back on the cart probably infected another patient. Right? So you don't know these things in the context of just looking at the nurse's day. You really have to step back in a wide lens to see the true impact um, that these operational failures have, both on the nurse's efficiency as well as on the patient outcomes. And I would say it's difficult. This is the kind of data we don't have in electronic health records. The, this data goes missing. We don't know the true cost. Okay. So what happens is these operational failures, and I'm trained as an industrial engineer. I learned something called the Pareto Principle, right? which is that 80% of the problem or the impact comes from 20% of the problems. And so what you should do is you should look for these disproportionate problems right, that are having a bigger impact. But with these operational failures, it doesn't really fit that. Because how they present is really, it's 32-minute problems. There wasn't, in all of my studies, there weren't two 30-minute problems, right? So this Pareto principle of, oh, just fix the two 30-minute problems, and that's going to get rid of all of these workarounds, didn't follow. Instead, it was kind of a long tail of problems. There was 30 different two-minute problems that were causing this wasted time and disruption. And the nurses, on average, spent 10% of their day just hunting and fetching stuff, we're, you know, fixing the system rather than actually being able to provide care for the patients. And again, like I said, the nurses spent an average of 45 minutes unpaid at the end of the shift in order to complete the bare minimum of tasks that they wanted to do for their patients. And that time that they were spending was actually due to these operational failures. Um, um, so what are the consequences of these workarounds? Well, on a positive note, the patients get the care that they need. So all the care was delivered um, due to these heroic efforts. Um, on the negative side, it could cause an operational failure in a different location, right? So going and stealing towels from the med surge unit definitely depleted their towel supply, right? Since I've started this, I have learned of lots of really crazy stories. Surgeons putting equipment they need in their trunks of cars, and driving between different operating rooms. Believe it or not, that was Stanford, right, that did that. 
Um, people hiding things up in the floorboards of ceilings, like IV poles and things that they need to make sure that they have them when they need them, things like this, right? So that definitely causes problems. And the organization loses information. So how frequently do these operational failures occur? I would say most organizations don't really know. What is the true cost of them? We don't know. What are the root causes? So the best time to figure out what caused something is when it occurred. It's very difficult three months later to go back and say, why did we not have the right kind of IV pump for this patient at this time? You could solve it on that day, but it's hard to solve it later. And so consequently, the organization loses the opportunity to learn how to improve their internal supply systems. And similar situations uh, will likely occur in the future. So this quote it gives an example of it. So this is a nurse from one of the hospitals. So we never told the pharmacy when we got a dose of medication that was more than we requested because we could just squirt out the extra. Right? Very, I can work around it. I'll just squirt out the extra. And we figured they were busy. They had not intended to make the mistake. And this is what I think is key. They wouldn't do anything about it anyway. So why take my two minutes and tell them something that they're not even going to respond to? Um, but she realized that it was sad because we weren't letting them have the information that they needed so they could fix their own problems. And for those of you who follow the news, the Boston Children's Hospital was just in the news due to overdoses of too much medication, anesthesiology medication drawn up on their patients, right? So very similar um, kind of situation in the news recently. And so only 6% of the time did nurses do second order problem solving. And what that was was doing what it takes to continue the task and expending additional effort to try to remove the underlying cause. So I would have coded in my data these three things. Speaking up that the failure happened at all, right? And that was the, the only thing that people did. The six, only 6% 6 of the time did the person speak up. I would have coded, but nobody did this, contributing an improvement idea, saying, hey, we could do this in the future to prevent that problem or experimenting with some kind of an improvement idea. And this really struck me, because to go back to my frosting factory, the plant manager would say, don't come to me with problems. Come to me with solutions, right? And I used to think that that was, OK, reasonable mantra. But now I realize with that mantra, he would have heard of exactly zero of the things that were going on. And it's not because the people we're being lazy or whatever, but this is really what I've discovered through my, sadly, decade of work studying this. The people who experience the operational failure, they don't know why it happened, and they don't know what it's going to take to fix it, because it didn't start in their department. It came from you know, downstream in the supply chain. So they know that it happened, but they don't know how the processes in the supplying department would need to be changed to fix that. So identification of these failures and knowing how to solve them, they're not co-located. One person doesn't know these things. So to have the bar of, hey, I don't want to hear any whining and complaining. Just tell me the solution. You're not going to get anything, right? So it's, it's been really interesting to me to come full circle on this. Um, so this second order problem solving is similar to Arduris and Schoen's, Schoen's double loop learning. So for those of you, any of you taking the CMEs, this is one of the test questions. Just, <laughs> just putting that out there for you, helping a little bit. That what it is is that when errors are detected and corrected, but in ways that modify the underlying norms, policies, and objectives, right? So let's change the system. Let's actually figure out what do we need to change to make these things not reoccur in the future. OK, so that was my first stream of research. Then the second one was, you know, since I wasn't seeing speaking up and trying to fix problems in the field, let me create an experiment, a lab, and see if I can create conditions in a laboratory where people will speak up and contribute improvement ideas. So what I did was I went to national nursing conferences. I literally went to every single national nursing conference <laughs> and ran an experiment 
uh, where I tried to lure people in with candy and little ribbons and a $10 payment so they could get their lunch. And what I was asking them to do was I was saying, come and spend you know, 30 minutes with me and administer medications to three patients. And so what I did was, um, you can kind of see it here a little bit, right? So this is the medication cart, the old-fashioned medication cart. It's kind of blurry, but each patient had a drawer with their name on it, and that drawer had, um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so these drawers had the name on it, and they had the medication for the patient. The computer um, prompted them, you know, it's 10 o'clock, this is the patient, these are the medications that are due, and then the nurse would go in the drawer, get the medications, and I had see-through pencil pouches that had the patient's name and date of birth on it, and by putting the medications into the pencil pouch, it was as if it was the stomach of the patient, and they had given the patient those meds. And then at the end, when the person was done, we could look in those pencil pouches and actually see what medications the nurse in what doses administered to those three patients. Right? So that was the experiment. And they had a little book here that had more information on the patient. I got all of this stuff from a, a company that provides um, nursing education training materials. So they were medications that looked like real medications, things like that. And what I did, um, my children think I'm very cruel. I just want to put that out there for doing this. I purposely planted operational failures into their medication system so that they didn't have the oral medication they needed for one of their patients. They didn't, he needed digoxin, and digoxin wasn't in her drawer. And they had to administer insulin, but in this little bin up here, I only gave them tuberculin syringes. I didn't give them an insulin syringe. So I purposely gave everyone the same two operational failures. And the reason that this was important from a research standpoint was in the real world, when I went out there, there was variance in how severe were these operational failures. So people would say, oh, you know, Anita, maybe people didn't speak up because this problem wasn't that important. But if it had been an important problem, I'm sure they would have spoken up. Right? So this controlled for that. Everyone got exactly the same thing, and these were arguably important things that were missing. This patient really needed her insulin. And so they had two choices of workarounds. So in their own, so this is one of the participants, and in his little cart here, there was another patient who had the digoxin. This was a fourth patient, so the nurse didn't have any data about this patient. It wasn't his or her patient. But if you looked in that drawer, you could steal his digoxin, right? A very common workaround. And you could use the tuberculin syringe, even though it's against most hospitals' policy to administer insulin in a tuberculin syringe. You could do the math calculation, and you could do it. So those were risky workarounds. And I could tell by looking in this drawer at the end and by looking at the syringe whether they did the risky workaround or not. And then there was a safe workaround, which was my very beautiful satellite pharmacy. <laughs> and this had a little bin where there were insulin syringes, and it had a box of digoxin. So they could go to the satellite pharmacy and do the safe, policy-compliant workaround. And what I want to point out is you can see this participant cell. There was four sort of people doing the experiment. They were very close to the pharmacy, right? So this was one of the things that I varied. This would be easy for him to do the safe because he was very close. And what I was looking at was, will they speak up to me about the operational failure? Because I was there. Did they use the policy compliance safe workaround? And I prompted them on a little piece of paper to contribute a written improvement idea. How can I make this experiment better in the future? And did they write a valid, actually, improvement suggestion? So those were, that was what I was looking for for the behaviors. And I randomly assigned them to two factors. As I mentioned, half of them were randomly placed close to that satellite pharmacy. And the other half were placed far away sort of like to the end of the wall over there. And I would say, as I was bringing them out to that, I would say, you know, I just didn't get my registration information in time. And I needed two, I needed two cells, but this was the closest one I could get. But over there by those balloons, over there by the balloons, that's part of my experiment. If you need to go there for any supplies, feel free. That's the pharmacy. So I would tell them and explain that, oh, it's just my incompetence that resulted in them having to be so far away. 
Um, and then the other two conditions was where I physically was. So was I physically in their little exhibitor booth with them or not? And so this resulted in, this resulted in four different conditions. And so take condition one and two, I mean condition one and four. The very far away exhibitor booth over there, if I was with them in that cell, they had a high level of access to the process owner because I was right there with them. They could talk to me. They could ask me questions. Um, and then that was coupled with condition one, where people in the easy workaround condition, I wasn't there. They'd have to walk all the way over to the other exhibitor booth to come and find me to tell me that they didn't have what they needed. Right? So that's how I created these four different cells. And then um, this is just a little schematic of what it looks like in terms of the distance. Right? This was the satellite pharmacy was right here in this cell. And then I just moved whether I was in that one or this one. And I had an undercover, very sly research assistant kind of gathering data <laughs> on the cell that I couldn't see. And so this is just a picture of what it looked like with the balloons. You can see for the people over here, they could see where the balloons were. Uh, so, sort of see the balloons over there, but it was a little farther for them to walk and get it. So this is what I found. In terms of speaking up, um, both access to the process owner and difficulty of working around had a large impact on whether they would speak up or not. So I'm super excited about this. I want to explain it. If we look down here, the easy cell, so very easy to get the materials you needed, and no manager in sight, I would say this is what I observed in nursing units. Managers were managing multiple units, so the manager was not easily available. And there were stuff stashed everywhere, very easy to go get whatever supplies you need. Under those conditions, and this, remember, my 6%, about 5% of the people would speak up and say, hey, I had a problem. So this mirrored what I was seeing in the field which as an experimenter was very sort of reassuring. As you increase level, that it was very easy to talk to me, and I was tried to be very approachable and very nice, right, so that people would feel comfortable talking to me. So a high level of access was able to get speaking up to around over 50% of the people would say, hey, I don't have what I need. Right? So just that alone had a huge impact on people's willingness to speak up about problems. And then the more difficult it was, to work around it. So the personal cost to the nurse, the more likely they were to speak up. This I thought was fascinating because it wasn't how serious was the problem to the patient. Right? It was how much of a pain was it for the nurse to be able to do the right thing. And the more painful it was, the more likely they were to say, hey, this was broken. So that was very fascinating to me. Um, so that was speaking up. So hooray, I, had, I was really happy, right? I was able to figure out, and this, I can't express enough how important this was. Because every time I would give the talk, my first talk, paper one, people would say to me, well, you know, it's just the way nurses are. It's just nursing culture. You know, we by nature want to fix things. We want to do whatever, so we're, we're, we're never going to speak up. Or, well, you need to hire the right kind of people. Hire more proactive people. There's a whole stream of literature on how to administer tests to people to know which right employees to hire, right? You want the proactive, positive kind of people, that it was somehow an individual characteristic. What I love about this experiment is it's saying it's not about the people, it's about the work environment that you give them, right? And if you give people a work environment where it's easy to talk and the person actually wants to hear, and it's hard to do the right thing otherwise, you're going to get this behavior. You're going to get the organizational learning behaviors that you would want. In terms of policy compliant workaround, kind of similar, similar things. If you look here, you can see that there's no mean effect of easy or difficult, right? That is, it didn't matter whether it was difficult or easy to get it. People on average did the same thing. But what really mattered was high level of access to me in combination with being difficult, right? It's that interaction term is the only thing that was significant here, you can see. And so what that is is that when it was difficult for people to do the work around, but I was right there with them, they would, 
they would comply, and 80, over 80% 80 of the time, they would use the safe workaround, right? Now, if we look over here, it's kind of interesting. This point, I want to, I want to point this out. When it was difficult for them to do a, work, a safe workaround, right, because they had to walk all the way, whatever, to go get the stuff, and I wasn't there, under those conditions, you know, only 47 or so percent of the people would actually use the insulin syringe. So keep that in mind. Remember that for a second. Because here's the result from using the insulin syringe. So what it was was the patient needed eight units of insulin. This is the, in, this is the insulin syringe. So eight units is about here. And the insulin syringe is marked in units. And the insulin that I gave them was 100 units per milliliter. So you could very easily, from a math standpoint, calculate how many milliliters that is. Because you just say, OK, the dose is eight units. The concentration is one milliliter per 100 units. And so therefore, I can use this milliliter syringe, and it would be 0 0.08 milliliters. And if you look volumetrically, it's exactly the same. This was astounding to me. I had a nurse who was helping me with this ex experiment, and she's the one who noticed it. 22% of the people who used the tuberculin syringe drew up a 10 times overdose. They drew up 0.8 and put it in the pencil pouch. Right? They would have given that insulin, the 10 times overdose. So it's fascinating to me because um, this wasn't what I did the experiment for. It wasn't an experiment on medication error. And yet, this kind of emerged from it. Um, and it's interesting because there, there is a whole safe practice on, on, on doing, um, administering insulin. And these milliliter tuberculin syringe had all those things. They had the orange cap, so you could see that it was a tuberculin and not an insulin syringe. They had the leading zeros, because this had been a theory on why people made this mistake, was because there wasn't a leading zero in the dot. Like all of those things, and yet we still saw 22% of the people making this mistake. So this is to be continued kind of research on why these things are happening. And in terms of contributing an improvement idea, um, what we found was it was really the difficulty of the workaround that made um, people take the time to write an improvement idea. And so that was significant, um, the difficult ones. We would get up to you know, 35 or so percent of the people contributed an improvement idea. So again, the same types of people I saw in hospitals not doing it would do it in the experiment. The other thing that's interesting is there's a baseline, sort of 10 percent of them did it. And so what was different between my experiment versus the real world? I asked them, right? I said, do you have any ideas on making your system better? And they had the time to do it because they were at a conference, right? They weren't actually really caring for patients. And so having a little bit of slack time and being prompted resulted in going from 0% of people having ideas to 10% actually contributing their improvement ideas. So those two things alone made a big difference. And so what is the summary? Given the prompt and time to do so, a minimum of 10% of people contributed an improvement idea. Again, a huge improvement based on what I saw in the field. And as the personal cost to the nurse increased, um, it increased speaking up to around 45% of the time and contributing improvement ideas up to 35%. And having a high level of access to the process owner, to a manager, whatever you want to call it, um, increased voice up to about 65%. And it dampened the use of these risky workarounds um, when it was difficult to engage in the safe. So what are the implications of this? Believe it or not, these conditions mirror very closely the way that Toyota, and don't shudder, I know healthcare people really don't like when I talk about Toyota, but Toyota as a company is really known for getting its workers to contribute improvement ideas. So they are leading at this. And in fact, uh, let's go right to this bullet down the bottom. Toyota as a company has on average 62 suggestions per employee per year, compared to the big three in Detroit have only 0.4 per employee per year. 
right? So they are known as a company that has been able to figure out how can we get organizational learning at the front lines, right? How can we harness this expertise? And the way that they do it is it's very difficult to work around a problem. So this is the work around the line. And that cord that he's hanging onto, that's the andon cord. So this is fascinating to me from putting on my lens as a person who spent a lot of time in hospitals. If this worker can't complete his tasks, right, and he's got so many space on, space on the conveyor belt to do it, if he can't complete them in time, to signal for help, all he has to do is go like this. That's it. And that sends a signal to his direct manager that he needs help. The manager will see that and will come immediately and help him finish his work on time and without making a mistake, without having to do a workaround. Think about how hard it is in hospitals for nurses who are having trouble with whatever reason for a patient, at least it's been my experience, to call for help. Right? How long is it that, that what, go to a phone, call, page, okay, who's the doctor that's on call like today? Okay, where's the doctor? Right, and call and then wait for that person to either come or page. It's not and on cord esque, right, by any means, which is very simple to send a signal that you need help and very difficult to work around. So those two conditions that I saw led to the most amount of improvement is the way that Toyota has designed their system. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And in conversion, or in contrast, hospitals actually are using blockages. So the favorite example I like to give is the computerized medication administration systems, like barcode scanners. Very hard to do a workaround, right? If, if the scanning isn't work, the computer system stops you. So that's the concept of a blockage. But the problem, in my opinion, is that hospitals haven't then also given a high level of access to a person who can help you when you run into that blockage, right? It's like, eh, blockage, figure it out on your own. In fact, to steal some of my thunder from another paper, when I was observing at Kaiser Permanente, the IT people in, that, in the hospital, they did not have their phone numbers published in the directory because they didn't want people calling them. <laughs> in their office, when we went to talk to them, they literally told us, like, we're going to put a blindfold on you so you don't know where we are, so you can't tell anybody how to find us. And their door was marked lactation consultation. Like, I'm not kidding you. I'm not making this up, right? So it's like blockages in the IT system, but very, very low level of ability to contact and get help when you needed it, right? So the exact opposite of what you would want um, in terms of those things. OK, and no surprise, um, Ross Capel has studied this a lot and has found that, lo and behold, people actually do really risky workarounds, right? It's what I saw in the experiment. Make it really hard to work around something, but then don't have a person available. People are not going to be able to do the right thing in those conditions, and they do risky workarounds to get the job done instead. And so the recommendation is provide staff with time and a prompt to contribute improvement ideas, right? And this is what Toyota does. End of shift kind of huddles. What could have gone better today? What can we do in the future to make it better, to make our jobs easier? And ensuring the presence of people who can actually work across these boundaries and fix the systems and get them done um, in conjunction with not being so easy to do um, the workarounds, like running down the hall and stealing stuff. OK. The other thing that I did was um, I could only study you know, eight different hospitals when I was doing ethnography because it takes a lot of time to like me physically be there every second of the day. So to get a bigger sample, I developed a survey and I administered the survey to hundreds of hospitals. And what I was looking at is are there organizational level variables that are associated with nursing units having higher levels of organizational learning and problem solving. So that's what I did in this study. And um, what I found, so I had managers rate how proactive are the nurses in terms of fixing their work systems in this unit. So that was my uh, dependent variable over there. And what I found was that the biggest driver was what I call problem solving efficacy. I purposely made the check mark bigger to connote that that was actually a very powerful factor. Psychological safety is feeling safe, pointing out my or other people's mistakes. So, you know, hey, um, 
just wanted to let you know that you actually made a mistake when you put the dosage for this, right? Actually, it's very risky. It feels very unsafe. And so how psychologically safe did nurses on that unit feel talking about some of these operational failure kinds of things? And so that was a little significant in explaining manager um, ratings of frontline system improvements. So it was significant. But by far, the bigger one was problem-solving efficacy, which is being confident that your unit has the ability to actually make it better. And the best example I have to explain why these variables came out like this was someone wrote in a little hand comment on the survey. And they said, I feel perfectly safe talking about these things, but no one ever does anything about it. Right? And so that made me realize that psychological safety is important, but it's not enough. Right? For these operational failures, because they're not killing patients, and they don't, right? They don't kill patients. They just make you less efficient, delay care, make your life frustrating, those kinds of things. In order to get people to spend the two or three minutes to talk about it, they have to think that that's time well spent. That it's rational, right? I'm not going to spend three minutes telling somebody that they sent up the wrong dosage of medication or whatever if they're not going to do anything with that information anyway. Right? So for operational failure, psychological safety is not enough. You also need to believe that the organization has the ability and the willpower to actually try to fix the systems. And that was what was associated with those kinds of behaviors. Also fascinating to me, individual felt responsibility, which is I as a person feel like it's my job to get the systems in my unit working well. That was statistically significant and negatively associated with unit level problem solving. Totally opposite of what I was expecting. So again, it's not about hiring individuals who feel like as an individual, I'm going to go out and make my system better. That actually has a negative consequence. It's similar to your talk with, you know, it takes a team to win a basketball tournament. It takes a team to fix these system kinds of problems, not individuals who feel that they're alone going to be able to do it. OK, so that was the survey. Uh, so now, this is the study that I did with Kaiser Permanente. They have an innovation consultancy. It's kind of like the Value Institute. They use, thank you, they use the techniques from IDEO. Does anybody know who IDEO is? A couple of people. So IDEO is a company that does user-centered design. A quick little spiel on them. They're the company that invented the, um, the Swiffer. The dry mop, right? And guess who hired them to invent Zwiffer? It was the company that makes the mop, the, the floor cleaning chemicals, like Mr. Clean. Because they wanted to figure out, how can we sell more of Mr. Clean? And when they went out and talked to people about, why don't you mop your floors, people are like, oh my gosh, I got to get out the bucket. I got to fill the bucket with water. Then I got to drag this heavy bucket. The bucket gets really dirty. We don't want to do any, we don't want to use water at all. And then Zwiffer, the, the Zwiffer was invented, which is a dry mop system. So IDO is a company that does user-centered design. And so what Kaiser did was they have people who are specialized in IDEO techniques who go out and actually ethnographic-wise spend time with these people, similar to what you did in the opioid, right? This is what our users want. Um, and then designing a system that meets the needs of the users. So we worked with them. And what we were able to do was we had a team of 20 or so people who were in the hospital, all throughout the hospital, in all the different functions at the same time. So that if one person observed an operational failure, we would have someone in the pharmacy and central supplies and biomed so we could figure out why did that happen in the first place. Right? So that, that's what we did. We had people throughout the whole organization. And what we found was we found that in terms of these operational failures, the, most, the biggest category was things that emerged in the nursing unit itself. I'll talk more about this in a minute. And then these are all the other sort of internal supply departments that are supplying things to the nursing units. So pharmacy, information technology, um, central supply, those kinds of things also were contributing. 
So this was fascinating that the nurse, part of the reason the nursing unit was so big in terms of it was because the nurses didn't really have the right level and quantity of equipment that they needed. So they compensated by protecting themselves. So the nurses would come in 30 minutes early to lay claim to a working vital sign monitor. This is totally illegal what they're doing here. They're not supposed to do this, right? You're not supposed to put your name on a piece of equipment that's supposed to be used by everybody in the unit and act as if you own it for the whole, for the whole shift just yourself, right? This was so bad that two nurses got in a physical fight over one of these vital sign monitors and the person went home on disability, right? Because they were fighting over these things. And then this is another compensatory behavior. This was fascinating to me. Nurses would make it look like these computers on wheels were broken. So they would turn off the display, they would do things. This person was clever and could flip, rotate the display 90 degrees Why? so that no one else would want to use it. <laughs> so it would be right where they left it when they needed it again, right? And so why are they doing these things? Why, you know, these are nurses who want to provide care, but they're creating operational failures for each other. Right? And we saw it because we had multiple people on the unit. So it is because the items needed for nursing care span multiple boundaries in terms of responsibility for ordering and keeping them in stock. And there were unclear levels of which they needed on that unit. So at what point do we trigger resupply or restocking? No PAR levels specified. No thoughts given to this at all. And accountability. So. Um, I just want to, these are the vital sign monitors I talked to you about, right? Where the fist fight happened over these things. So for instance, the unit purchases them, but they're maintained by sterile processing and biomed. So guess what happens? Nobody thinks anybody's responsible for it. Biomed says, nursing department needs to do it. Nursing department says, biomed fixes these for us. And so even though there was a process, nobody really owned the process and could fix it. I, I could talk more about this, but I don't have time. In terms of PAR level, the nurses said we needed eight, but there really were only four on the unit, and there was nothing that would trigger, hey, we don't have enough, we need more. There was no system for these supplies. It was just sort of like they'll take care of themselves, was kind of the attitude, and we're doing our job. So I spent time with the biomed person, and literally, we took a pink tag IV pole. So this was a pole that nurses had said it doesn't have the attachment it needs. So they, we made them follow the process. They didn't want to do it. We said, pink tag it. We want to see what happens when you flag this needs repair. The biomed person came up, took it, this naked, IV, this naked vital sign monitor with no attachments, took it down to his little cave, put attachments on it to calibrate it, said, oh, it's calibrated fine, took the attachments off, and brought it back up into the unit in the exact same condition it was sent down in. But if you were talking to people, they would say, you know, it's not my problem. My department did everything we were supposed to, and they were correct. The biomed person followed his department's processes exactly, right? So he says, if there's a problem with these vital sign monitors, it must be the nursing unit's fault. The, I don't know why the nurses steal these attachments, right, and take them home, or patients take them, like all types of stuff. But the biomed person felt like, hey, I'm not part of the problem because I'm following my department's processes. And when we talked to everybody involved in the process, everybody felt the same way. But what it was was the process hadn't been designed to work, but nobody thought that they could be part of the solution. They all thought, it's his fault, it's her fault. It's not my fault, right? And it turns out it's nobody's fault. Everybody's doing their job right. It's just the processes really aren't designed to ever deliver. The processes aren't designed to deliver what the current patient's needs are. The specific patients have specific needs, but the supply departments are delivering generic stuff, right? Why? Because they want to buffer themselves from the variation of day-to-day -day patient care. Um, I'll talk more about this. Um, so for instance, sterile processing, they, their work was not triggered by specific patient needs. They would remove dirty pumps from the dirty utility room, clean them and bring them back, completely independent of what the specific patients on that unit needed. And what happens is, I have an example of this. So this is an example. Patient has bowel surgery. They get IV antibiotics on a single pump. Patients move to the med surge unit, right? So they have a single IV pump. Very predictably, after several days, the physician realizes, oh, the lack of GI motility, they need TPN, 
right? Total parental nutrition. So now what? The nurse reads that order for TPN, knowing that the patient is on IVs and antibiotics, and said, oh, we need a triple pump. So now the nurse, urgent, has to find a triple pump, even though what I would argue is it was predictable way back here, the likelihood that that patient would need a triple pump. And if the physician and nurse had sort of had an opportunity to talk and discover this, could have put the patient on a triple pump to begin with. And preventing the need, and I'll show you what happens in this little comic strip, right? Um, that the nurse looks in the clean utility room for a triple pump, but of course there's no triple pump there. So then she looks in the dirty utility room, it's not there, and then she goes literally room by room until she finds an unused triple pump, then she cleans the triple pump, then she's gotta go, gotta change out the single for the triple. It's a tremendous amount of work um, that happens with that. And as you can see, the TPN was delayed by 10 minutes, and 30 to 50% of the nurse's work was wasted because that could have been solved. There's a lack of knowledge transfer across departmental boundaries. So what happens is the physician predictably knows this is the likely combination of medications post-surgery, but doesn't realize the implications of that knowledge for the downstream work. The nurse knows, hey, if I have these medications, I need a triple pump to deliver them, right? But isn't able to communicate that to the physician of, hey, these combinations of medication, if we knew about it ahead of time, we could have put the patient on a triple pump to begin with and avoided all of this last minute running around. So this, for me, is unfinished work. But I think as an organization, you're really well positioned to sort of look at these kinds of problems because I think, why can't every patient have a bill of material, right? For these conditions, these are the bill of material equipment medications that they're likely to need and feed that information ahead of time before it becomes an emergency to the supply department so that they're better coordinated with what patients actually need instead of having it discovered at the time it's needed by the nurse at the bedside and then it becomes a problem. Part of the issue is the fact that the silos, and I love seeing the value streams, is that the value streams that you had, would help get around this, right? Which is the med surge manager who's in charge of that, actually reports up to the chief nerf nursing officer, sterile processing reports up to the COO, and the physician, the chief medical officer. Each of these departments have their own budget. And when I talked to the biomed engineer, he said, I could put the attachment on the vital sign monitor, but then it would come out of my budget. Right, and so that was it, it was a showstopper. So, so to summarize, operational failures are frequent and they delay patient time. Um, they stem from supplies not being directly connected to patients' needs. So there's a need to increase interconnectedness between the supply departments, what they're supplying, and what patients actually need. And that the drivers of organizational learning, again, this is the test question for people taking CMEs, um, is if it's more difficult to work around operational failures, they're more likely to engage in learning behaviors. If managers are easily available and motivated to resolve the issues, you're gonna see more learning behaviors. And units have to have belief that they can solve the problems. So the capability and competencies to fix, to engage in this system improvement, and psychological safety, that it's safe to speak up about these types of things. So thank you very much um, for inviting me, and I've enjoyed my day. Thank you very much for the talk. I'm Justin Glasgow, part of the Value Institute and one of our hospitalists as well. And listening to this, I was thinking about the, the general frame in healthcare to promote just culture, work towards high reliability organizations, of which Christiana has both of those as our tenets. Um, I also work as the uh, unit-based medical director for our observation unit. And so I see some of the reports we get in terms of possible organizational failures, and I think that currently is our framework for making sure that a manager is available. Yep. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what is the impression you have about the difference between an in-person contact versus a yes. got to go to the IT system to report a failure? Um, yeah, so um, it was my experience that when a person was there face-to-face, 
there was much more communication. So only in a few instances would the nurse fill out like an incident report type of thing in a computer system. And in those, I'm trying to remember, I think it was maybe two in all my data set. And it was because the nurse felt like she might be held liable for some kind of clinical issue that was going to happen. So it was really CYA that made her take the time. Because it took, I think, three minutes to fill out this electronic um, incident report. And so it did happen. It wasn't zero. But the motivation was because she thought that the patient might have some clinical negative repercussions for the conditions on the unit. And she wanted to have it on record that she had flagged it as a concern. So it was a lot less and only a subset of the issues. Hi, my name is Megan Lane Fall. I'm a visiting scholar with the Value Institute. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you alluded to the variability in patient care as a challenge to operations. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how you deal with variability in patient flow and patient needs. You know, one day you may have an ICU that's 50% full, and then it's 100% full, and you need to bring more people in. So how do you help organizations deal with that? Variability. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. I think that's the million dollar question with healthcare is the variability. So, um, so I have studied, believe it or not, um, car repair sort of shops have a lot of good ideas on how to deal with variability. And what they've done is they take, and this is a data kind of thing, so you guys, I'm so excited, could actually do this. You look at your DRGs and you say, what are the predictable kind of DRGs that have a very sort of stable base level? And in car repair shops, that was brake repair. And so what they did was they took the predictable demand and they dedicated some, they figured out how much capacity do we need for this very predictable stream of demand. And then they dedicated some of the bays to doing just that job. So it had all of the equipment, the training, the processes to do brake jobs. Because what they had done before was they said, car repair is so variable, right? Like cars are equivalent to people needing healthcare, cars needing repair, right? So they had every bay completely flexible, could service any kind of repair. And what they wanted to get down to was they wanted to have single day, like you call that day and you can get your car fixed that day. And they were able to do it by taking the predictable stream and dedicating some resources to treating that condition. And then the few that were variable, they made those be the multi the multi-unit cells. But what was fascinating was they took their most experienced mechanic and they put him on the phone as the person who triaged what was wrong with the car. Because by listening to what the customer was saying, he was able to diagnose without even seeing the car. Because what used to have to happen is the patient, the customer would bring the car in, they'd put it on the thing, they'd lift it up, they'd figure out what was wrong, they'd put it down, they'd say, OK, now we're going to order the parts, and it would be three days later. But by putting their most experienced person in the front lines dealing with that interface, he was able to then say, OK, I know with certainty what that's going to be, and then order the parts and get that part system going so they could do same day repair. And this I see in healthcare all the time. You know, We don't put our best physicians sort of like in those triage kind of directing the flow and predicting what's needed in terms of resources, right? Because we think it's not time value. But if you think about how expensive it is a day in the hospital and reducing that length of stay, I mean, that's where all, speaking like a business professor, but like that's where the money is, right? Is getting that average length of stay down. And so putting sort of the best person in the front to figure out how we can make the flow more efficient, I would say would be money well spent. But I haven't seen any hospitals doing that. Since we are... I'm with the Organizational Excellence Department, and one of the things that we're beginning to embark upon, and Ken Silverstein and other leaders uh, obviously know about our uh, desire to move towards a lean uh, type of organization, and you know, having worked in automotive and uh, being an industrial engineer, I think we're kind of yep. thinking along the yep. same, li same lines. Can you talk just a little bit about maybe what you've seen uh, some hospitals having some success in implementing lean daily management systems, and you talk about having huddles and things like yep, that yep. to promote some yep. of the things that yep. you Yeah, absolutely. About. So the best example I have of this was a hospital in the UK. And um, you know, in the UK, they've got government regulated sort of minimums of the time a patient has to be in an emergency department before he gets admitted to the hospital. And so this hospital was able to make amazing improvement on it um, by six different changes they did. So the first thing is they moved away from it being an emergency department 
mandate to a hospital mandate because just as you guys talked about, if you're not discharging them from the hospital at the rate at which they're flowing in from the ED, you're not going to be able to place those patients in an ED bed. So they made it be a hospital level metric and not an ED metric. So get everyone sort of on the same team. The other thing they did, which I think is fascinating, is they figured out that they could actually schedule visits to the emergency department. So a large number of people coming to the emergency department actually weren't urgent, but their primary care physicians had said, hey, you should go to the emergency department and get that checked out or follow up. So they coordinated with the local physicians to say, um, we'd love to see your patients you know, between, and then they gave them the hours of the day that the ED, again, this natural predicted variation versus unpredicted variation, they had dead spots in the day. So they would schedule people who weren't urgent to come during those downtimes to level the flow. So that was, to me, was a really novel concept, is actually thinking, can we partner with the community physicians to actually try to schedule these emergency department arrivals when we're less busy? So that was fascinating. They did the carving off of some of the capacity to do the more predictable um, uh, urgent care as opposed to emergency department care. And then they, they did the getting a physician they actually had on the phone because what they did was they studied how many of our emergency department patients actually have to come to the emergency department. And it turned out only like 30% of them, right? And so they wanted to not have patients flowing through the emergency department, which is the bottleneck that didn't really need to. And what they found out was that by being available f to consult with physicians about medication changes and medications, they were able to prevent some of the um, emergency department visits completely. Because patients were going because they wanted that second check of the physician opinion. And so they made that available via phone um, as like a separate thing, and it really, uh, really reduced the flow in. So it was match the outflow with the inflow, do that mathematically, right? You know what the rate is coming in, so now you've got to design your hospital to have your outflows match that inflow rate. And then how can we stop flow that we don't need, right? By doing really creative things. And if you think about how much value is there, you can actually spend a lot of money on solutions that seem crazy if it keeps people out of the hospital in the first place. So, so that was one of the ones that I think had great success. I'm happy to talk more, thanks. Well, Dr. Tucker, thank you for that excellent presentation. We certainly learned a lot. This concludes our, our, our event. I have one final task. Um, uh, Sandy, I know you hate this stuff, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that is I want to thank you on behalf of the Value Institute team for your service, your guidance, your mentorship, your wisdom. Uh, we have definitely benefited from it. I, you, know, you and I talk on a personal level. And on behalf of the, in the entire team, we have a gigantic thank you card with signatures from everyone uh, for you. Today is Sandy's last day with Christiana Care as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.